We are 931, going on 1,000, still gaining a lot of rating every game. So uh, we're provisional. And let's play 10 plus 5. And we got an 1188 with black. So once again, the premise of the speedrun is that I play traditional old school openings, nothing crazy, and we play very, very solid. Okay, Italian. Now, if you're a beginner, if you're in this rating range, obviously, as you know, there's knight f6 and there's bishop c5, two main moves. Um, if you're a beginner, going into the fried liver is a little bit questionable unless you know the theory. So my recommendation is to stick with bishop c5 there's just less tricky lines in bishop c5 and 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 it's just easier to learn so c3 is the main move now we go knight f6 and white has d4 and d3 d3 is what the what the big guns play d4 is of course the old main line this is the traditional move and this leads to an extremely theoretical line that uh, we've had before in the speed run so e takes d4 c takes d4 now very importantly we don't drop our bishop back this allows white to steamer loss in the center we have to give this very important check on b4 this gives us a tempo to either capture the pawn or to strike back in the center with d5 bishop d2 okay so in this position the does, who knows what the main continuation is for black give me the sequence and i'm going to show you guys a cool line that avoids the main line theory and still equalizes so the main move is not knight takes d4. That's the move we're going to play, folks. The main move is bishop takes d2 check. Knight b takes d2. And then d5, striking in the center. Unfortunately, that's my game against Sevian from the US Championship, by the way. There's a force draw in that line. Not a force draw, but it's a very colorless position. But a far more uh, theoretically narrow and, in my opinion, more interesting move is knight takes d4. It looks very scary to capture the spawn, but... If you, if you know the theory, you can trust that uh, you're going to get away with this move. So this is also not very well known, even by people who play the Italian. Okay, knight c3 is already a very bad bad reaction. This this just g lets us off the hook scot-free. And not only that, it, it gives us a favorable trade. So what should we take, the knight or the bishop? Or should we take the knight with the bishop? We should, of course, take the bishop. I mean... Clearly taking the bishop is best. He pre-moves knight takes d2. And now we have another decision to make. Clearly we can castle, right? We can complete our development. Or we can take on d4. We can take another pawn. How do you make such a decision? Well, a lot of it is intuitive, right? A lot of it is just, do you feel comfortable taking this pawn? You quickly look for forks and various uh, nasty ideas. I don't see anything terribly nasty after knight takes d4 because white is so passive here on the other hand if you want to play like a good russian schoolboy there's nothing wrong with castling and for the purpose of this speed run we're going to continue playing in sort of a conservative fashion and uh we're going to avoid the need for unnecessary calculation we already have one pawn if he chooses to defend this pawn okay so he didn't choose to defend this pawn, but if he did we would have also had a very nasty check on e8 now that we've castled, it's clear that we can just take this pawn. Of course, now we can take. One thing I would check for, do you guys see this x-ray, right? The queen is x-raying the knight. Just make sure that there's no discovered attacks that are dangerous. For instance, if there was a queen here, the move knight d to e4 would have been very nasty because it would have simultaneously hit the queen and established pressure on the knight. Okay, so there we go. Now that I mentioned it, we have to choose our bishop move very carefully. I think a lot of people would be tempted to play bishop c5. Who can tell me why bishop c5, although totally fine, is a little bit inaccurate? Because of knight d to e4, winning a tempo, although we can play bishop b6 there, but then the other knight gets to d5, and we've given white a lot of activity. Let's take c3. Let's simplify. We're up two pawns. Where do we want this knight? Doesn't really matter. We can play knight c6. We can play knight e6. Um, we can even counterattack the bishop with d5. Uh, I, let's just, let's play the simplest move, knight c6. I, I don't really see the need to spend a lot of time on this decision. And I think if you're watching the speedrun, 
and you know you're trying to extract the most out of it i think some people start to overly obsess with basic decisions like where to put the night you spend five minutes on this and you get into time pressure in your mind you always have to have this understanding which decisions are likely to be important which are likely to be less important this is clearly in the other less important category now he's given us the chance to go d5 so we will play d5 and then get this bishop out perhaps to e6 maybe queen to f6 hitting the pawn on c3 another move to consider But I like the development of the bishop to e6. And bishop e6 is a classic example of the sort of, how do I call it, 100 bits, the idea that not every piece needs to be, needs to be you know, distributing the COVID vaccine or climbing Mount Everest. Um, bishop is defending d5 and f7. Bishop is defending d5 and f7, doing a perfectly fine job on e6. A move like bishop f5 would appeal to more people. A move like bishop f5 would, would appeal to more people, but that bishop would also be a little bit more vulnerable to moves like queen f3. Yeah, the bishop is sort of a little bit aimless on f5, whereas on e6 is just doing everything at once. Okay, knight f3. And now I would propose getting this queen off of its initial square and activating it with queen f6. And perhaps bringing the rooks to the center. Uh, following that is a good idea. A thousand bits from Chaos Planet. Thank you. Holy smokes. Rook a d8 is coming. Why rook a d... Okay, so rook b1. Now, again, queen takes c3 forces us to calculate lines. Queen takes c3, rook takes b7. I honestly don't don't see the need to calculate it. Now, how should we defend this pawn? Yeah, b6. Pros and cons. Generally, you want to play this move, if possible, against rook b1, because you're blunting the rook. The rook is biting into granite now. Another favorite expression. Whoa, thank you for the bits. However, what is the drawback of the move b6? Who can tell me? There is a clear downside to playing b6. It isn't important here well it weakens the light squares but more specifically it weakens the knight the, na the knight becomes undefended so you can see that if your king was on e8 for example this move would be very dangerous as it stands the knight has a perfectly good spot on a5 that it can jump to and potentially later it can move out to c4 so i factored that in when i played b6 in the event that you are uncomfortable weakening your knight you can play rook a b8 which is not ideal because it ties down your rook but that's an alternate way of defending the pawn you could, we could have also played knight a5 here, by the way, and then b6. That would have been another possibility. Queen b3. Oh, this is a cool moment. I, I'm positive that a lot of you are seeing this and immediately thinking d4. But what did I say about this knight? If we play d4, white's going to play queen a4 or queen b5, hitting the knight on c6. And guess what? We might end up losing that pawn on d4. So a much more mature move here is to play knight a5, hitting the queen from the side, getting the knight onto a defended square, and potentially we can start expanding on the queen side with c5, eventually aiming to go d4, create a passer. We still have to activate our rooks, but we'll get to that. How do I know that the knight on the rim is fine here? Well, again, it's for two reasons. First of all, it's anchored by the pawn, and that's always a good situation. Second of all, the knight is doing stuff. It's aiming at the c4 square and it's controlling squares on the queen side so you don't have to worry about it being on the rim queen b5 again queen takes c3 if we look a little bit further it allows rook e to c1 and i really don't want to give away the c7 pawn. i don't want to give white any activity whatsoever what comes to mind this queen is annoying let's kick it away with c6 thank you trapper city baby let's kick it away and you guys can see that I'm really biasing my play toward uh, toward not calculating too much when it's not necessary and instead focusing on making fundamentally sound moves. Now, once we hit like 13, 1400, now we definitely can get away with it. Thank you, Lord Expo with the Prime. 
Why c6 over a6? Because in a way, c6 kind of kills two birds with one stone. If you think about it, c6 creates a little bit of a pawn chain, maybe takes the burden off of the bishop on e6. So later, oh, huh, look at that. So later, i.e. right now, we can play bishop f5, which to be fair, we would have played even if the pawn was on c7. But right now, he can't even take on d5. That was perfect timing. <laughs> Okay, so question answered? Question answered? <laughs> give me that rook. And uh, give me that pawn. No need, no reason not to take it. Hopefully you saw that knight g5 is a possibility, which can easily be parried with a move g6. But don't be afraid of made in one threats just because they're made in one threats. Um, I think some people would be tempted to play h6 here, which would be fine. In in a classical game, I'd probably go rook f e8, prioritizing the open file over the, another pawn, because we're already up, th you know, two pawns in an exchange. But again, I'm playing very straightforwardly here. Now, what is our plan of action here? Well, first of all, let's get control of the e file, first order of business. Why with this rook? Because if we had gone with the other rook, and the rook on f8 would be basically cornered. It would just have nothing to do on f8. As it, as it is, we can bring the other rook to d8 potentially to support the d5 pawn. Okay, h3. Now, clearly, trading is good for us. Let's get the other rook to e8 now. I'm playing fast here. The moves are extremely simple. Um, you can ask me to repeat any of the logic. Very good practice in these situations, right? What can possibly go wrong for us? We have everything protected. What's the last thing that we need for in, for, in order for us to breathe easy? There's one more thing I want to do. Make some Luft. Now, I've talked about this in a previous speedrun, so listen, this is going to be an important point. 99% of people, when they hear the word Luft, you think of the move H6 or H3. In reality, if you want to be, you know, super accurate about it, you always, you also have to consider a move like g6 or g3, which in many cases is a far more efficient and effective way to create Luft. Why is that? Well, here it doesn't matter. It's completely hypothetical because white has no pieces left. But in general, when your opponent has a bishop of the same color as the Luft square, you have to make sure that a situation doesn't arise where you make Luft, but they've got a bishop on d3 and you've wasted your time because that square is still controlled. It's much harder, even in this case, to control the g7 square. Now, what's the downside of going g6? Well, it weakens a lot more squares. It weakens these dark squares. But in many cases, if your opponent doesn't have, let's say, a dark sword bishop, or in this case, where we're up a gazillion points of material, there's simply no way for white to exploit that. So especially this is very true in the end game, where, uh, where, where making Luft you know, can be a very important operation where you need to arrange your pawns correctly rather than just automatically playing h6. I actually have a great example of that, but I'm going to have to hunt it down. It's in this endgame book that I have, which I can't even find. So I found the book. I think this is going to be a good way to round off. Okay, so knight h2. And again, let's be... Ah, oh, rookie one just wins the game immediately. Oh, he has queen e2. But still. The knight's going to g4, by the way. So if we want to be really mean, we could play h5. As he's thinking, I'm looking for the example so that we don't have to waste any time. Okay, queen a2. Hey, you know, let's go h5. Let's, let's, let's cut off all counterplay. Just shut everything down. No knight g4. We ain't letting the knight get anywhere. This is mastering endgame strategy by Helston, which is a very advanced endgame book even for me. I mean, it's got some examples that are highly convoluted, but an amazing book nonetheless. Okay, um, g3. Okay, we can win this game in many different ways. We can simply push the deep on. Um, we can also essentially try to force a queen trade with something like knight b3. But okay, we'll push the deep one because that's the easiest. Yeah, this one's over. 
Yeah, I'm still looking. I know it's in this book. Okay, and he resigns. So this is the game, not a particularly famous game. I mean, you guys might have heard of Rosenthalis. He's a GM. Um, McNabb is also a GM from Scotland. And this position occurred in their game. Okay, so it's black to move. It's black to move. And uh, if, if, if you get your bearings here, it's clear that black is trying to win and white is trying to make a drop. Rosenthalis is up a pawn. So what move comes to mind immediately with black? I mean, you look at this for a couple of seconds and you realize that the pot on b7 is hanging and you your your hand aims to make the move. Well, rook a2 check doesn't give anything. Rook a2 check just king back to f3 and you can repeat moves. But b6, right? But what is white's source of counterplay here? If you play b6, white's just going to start checking. You check, check, and you can't escape the checks. If you try, you're going to end up losing all of your pawns. So I'm just going to mop these up. Not good. So in order to understand Rosenthal's approach, first of all, you have to realize he decided to give away the b7 pawn because the, uh, the extra pawn is not black's only advantage in this position. The other source of black's advantage is contained in the fact that white has these extremely weak pawns, right? e4, e5 are very weak. And this rook on a3 is very well placed. It's cutting off the white king. So a lot of you guys are coming up with a move g6. This is where the fun occurs. g6 is a good move. But the problem with g6 is that after rook takes b7, king f8, um, let's say rook b8 check, and white gets behind the pawn. White can also go and play a move like h4. White can play a move like h4. And you guys see where this is heading. White's going to lock you in. That king is not going to be able to, to, to escape its cage. So the idea is to kill two birds with one stone. We go pawn g5, creating this loft on g7, but also freezing white's kingside pawn so that black's king will essentially have a pathway through g6 and potentially to the kingside. And this wins black the game. This idea, it doesn't necessarily lead to a decisive advantage, but it gives black a chance. h5. Um, and, and Rosenthalitz ends up outplaying him here. It's a very difficult position to defend. h4. And now g4, exclam. This creates a very weak pawn on g3. And this is all because black played g5. Here, here, here. Sorry, king e2. King e2. Rook b3. Rook takes a7. Rook takes b5. And black ends up winning the game. King e3, rook b3. King f2, rook b2. Very tricky. It should be a draw. So king e3, the idea is rook g2. King f1. And rook back to b4. As Antalus ends up winning the g6, the e4 pawn. And then he comes around and wins the e5 pawn and wins the game. Anyways, I didn't, didn't want to like make too big of a deal of this. But that's an example of basically doing two things with one move in the end game. Not exactly the same, but hopefully you kind of see the resemblance. Yeah, so in the game, by the way, after knight takes c4, the only thing I'll say is that the main line here is bishop takes b4, uh, knight takes b4, and now bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, queen b3 check, winning back the knight. And this leads by force to an endgame. King f8, queen takes b4, queen e7. White has to trade because otherwise there will be a discover check, and this is an equal endgame according to the engines. So... That's the main line, and knight takes d4 is a fully fledged alternative to bishop takes d2 check. But uh, yeah, the way that he played, you know, giving up the second pawn, the game was pretty much over pretty quickly. So um, I won't spend too much time analyzing. Uh, I think I kind of explained everything during the game. And um, we will end the stream for today. It was a longer stream than anticipated, but I'm tired, guys. I'm going to go to bed. We're definitely going to do more speedrunning later. I'm going to try to stream tomorrow, uh, maybe even in the morning. So stay tuned. Thanks for hanging out and appreciate the support.